connected to regional. So I think we're now live, and I think it. And we are. Recording. We actually have a couple of. <laughs> we have a couple of people. Oh gosh. Um, Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased that you are all here. And uh, why don't I introduce you? And mm -hmm. I'm really quite interested in, in learning where we are with virtual reality. So um, um, our panelists uh, today are uh, Sam Glassenberg, who's the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Level X in the United States, Jana Nikanen, um, who is Chief Executive and of Divine Robot in Sweden, Amy Peck, who's the founder and chief executive officer of Endeavor VR in the United States, and Sean Reyes, who is the U Utah Attorney General in the United States. And I'm John Markoff. I'm retired, but I still write occasionally for the uh, New York Times in the United States. And um, I'd like to begin with uh, what I, I think is a bit of a puzzle. Um, and that is, um, our conference literature, for example, asserts that VR has been taking off in a big way during COVID, uh, which I thought would actually be the case. And the first thing I wanted to ad address to the panel is if you feel that that's true. And if, if it's not, um, why not? I mean, to paraphrase Peter Thiel, um, I feel like they promised us virtual reality and all we've gotten so far is Zoom. So am I wrong? Um, Sean, can I start with you? Um, sort of. What's your sense of the state of VR today? Sure, thanks so much. Uh, maybe I should give you just a, a, a tiny bit of background. I don't go into the whole CV, okay. but I'm sure some people are, are wondering what's the Politico doing in this panel. And uh, I think you're supposed to be um, you know, at the 3.30 panel. Um, I, I grew up in tech, uh, represented a lot of tech companies um, as outside counsel, then was general counsel for a tech company. Uh, no Peter and many of the tech founders. Uh, I was up in the Bay Area um, and then ran a tech venture fund for a time. We invested in VR plays. Uh, so would speak at, you know, E3 and uh, fun places where we could discuss the evolution of VR. And then when I took over as attorney general in 2013, wanted to integrate a lot of the tech um, background into law enforcement. So I can't speak for the other industries. My sense is yes, that uh, tech has, uh, VR has expanded during COVID, but I can tell you with a certainty that in terms of our law enforcement functions, which I'm happy to talk about once everybody else gets a chance to speak, um, we have seen a definite rise in part because um, predators have exploited children schooling at home and children not being out and about with uh, more eyes and ears to look out for these predators. So as the predators have taken advantage of the situations, our VR functions that work uh, hand in hand with law enforcement have definitely amped up in our attempt to better protect uh, citizens. World. Okay. John, can I ask you to chime in? What's your perspective of the, the impact of COVID on the VR world, the technology and market? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, Jan and I can hear from Sweden, the CEO of Divine Robot. We make uh, virtual reality simulations for, um, among others, law enforcement um, forces, but we also work with the uh, water industries and such. So, um, as you say, we know we haven't seen a mass adoption during the past year, but I think uh, in general, um, consumer market for VR has been uh, a bit slow. Uh, everybody thought it was going to take off in the gaming industry, uh, where I have my background from. Um, but uh, I think looking at the hardware, it's, it still has taken some time for the hardware to become um, efficient or, or um, I mean, easy enough to use and cheap enough for, for consumers to buy. But um, we're seeing a lot of adoption in, um, um, in, the, in the corporate world. Um, I don't know if you can hear me properly, if the connection is all right here. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so I think for, for training purposes, for instance, uh, among corporations, there's great need, especially now that people cannot travel as much as before and they cannot go to training facilities and so forth. It's, uh, it's a lot more convenient to use uh, VR. We're still working with the same clients as before. Oops. Uh, Peter, I was wondering Sorry. if you could uh, you could add your perspective. Is there there might not be a Peter on. John. I don't know if Peter's on. If there's Peter. Oh, oh I'm sorry, <laughs> Sam. Was Sam. Um, <laughs> I, I, oh. had that <laughs> I was trying to do process of elimination and try to figure. I, it out. Thank you very so, much for sticking with me, Sam. Yeah, <laughs> sure, no problem. So look, so so when it comes to uh, it depends on your definition of virtual reality. If you're talking about headset virtual reality, you know, we're going to put the brick on the face, then I think adoption hasn't been nearly where at least the analysts um, and, and, and some of the futurists were projecting. I think if you even look back years ago, you know, um, when there was just a tremendous amount of investment being made in headset virtual reality, you even had the founders of Oculus saying, guys, there's a lot more investment going in here than the market is going to be able to support in the first five to 10 years, a lot of people are gonna lose money. Um, I've been surprised during the COVID pandemic at the degree to which headset VR has actually started taking off. Um, we're seeing a lot of people spending their Sunday nights doing you know, social VR experiences on Oculus Quest and whatnot. In the enterprise, um, I think that uh, as a result of COVID, um, headset VR experiences have not been so widely adopted. And that's largely because the intended use of those headsets was to take them off of one person and put them on another person. And nobody wants to touch the same object that someone else touched a few minutes ago at all right now. Um, I think post COVID uh, that's going to change. And I think if you look separately from, uh, from headset VR and sort of virtual experiences that people experience on their phones, um, or on their computers, that has rapidly, rapidly accelerated. Um, and we're seeing a lot of, you know, of interesting applications um, where, you know, people can do medical training um, or other forms of, of training and engagement remotely, not just through Zoom, but uh, using other channels. Okay, thank you. Um, Amy, I got that name correct. Um, <laughs> tell, me yes. about, uh, tell me about the year for Endeavor and a little bit yes, about so what you yeah, so at Endeavor, we um, are a strategy and consulting firm around immersive technology, and, and uh, we work primarily with enterprises on strategy. And of course, in the early days, you know, it was all about training because there's so much data to support the efficacy of VR training. You know, relative to the pandemic, we've seen companies that were already sort of working with VR um, you know, in training or with process or even with, with sort of marketing and customer facing initiatives, starting to look at other business units. So we're seeing a, a lot more sort of penetration because collaboration is a great use case. And almost every business unit needs some form of collaboration. And especially with remote teams, it's a way for teams to actually stay connected. Now, I'll, I'll put the caveat that these numbers aren't huge because there, there weren't large deployments prior to the pandemic, but we are seeing that, you know, POC jail, we're sort of moving, you know, from POC to pilot and into scale to a certain degree. So we're seeing a lot more headsets being deployed within a company to remote teams, especially around things like design, um, you know, or any any disciplines that record that are already working with 3D assets, because it's a it's a fairly light lift to bring those 3D assets and to work with them in these virtual environments. Okay, thank you, Sean. I wanted to ask you specifically about the Vitra system. I saw the YouTube uh, uh, promotion that you had, and it's really quite remarkable. If you could describe it a little bit, that system for law enforcement. But I have one specific question, actually. And that is, how much time does a police officer need to spend in that system to make a change in behavior? 
And so let me answer all of those. First of all, I just wanted to rip off of something that Sam said, because I, I agree that, uh, you know, talking about VR, uh, 3D headset VR, um, a Utah company created one of the most, I think, transformative entertainment VR systems called the Void that Disney purchased for hundreds of millions of dollars. You layer it on top of uh, a soundstage and you're fighting Lord Vader uh, in all of his uh, evil glory. It's, it is incredible, but it, it literally died during COVID because no one wanted to um, share uh, headsets. And then when Sam mentioned, you know, whether it's performing surgery or addressing phobias and PTSD, helping victims uh, or patients with strokes and Parkinson's, all of those things are moving forward. And on our front, where we have made the most impact, it's not headset VR. It's a, it's really kind of, some people would say analog. It's 300 degree backlit screens, but it's raised platform, kind of ready player one, haptic sensor, uh, surround sound, immersive. And it's kind of Dungeons and Dragons too, because the, the secret sauce is I have a person navigating the entire ecosystem. And when an, uh, an officer or a soldier is put in that system and, forced to confront very dangerous shoot, don't shoot situations, de-escalation of violence training. If they're doing well, the dungeon master, if you will, uh, the person who controls the environment can add an extra hostile. They can add uh, a victim. Uh, they can they can throw in uh, a hostage. And, and depending on how the person reacts and responds, even the language on the fly can be changed. The, the person's, uh, you know, reactions... Uh, and, and so for us, it has been a marvelous tool to address public safety for, for officers themselves and have them better be able to navigate these horrendous no-win situations, but especially in the aftermath uh, of what happened with the, the Floyd case. And, and even back in 2014, uh, we were starting to implement this system uh, after police violence cases, it has helped us really put officers in situations where they can make mistakes, get hundreds of repetitions because your question is an astute one. How long does it take to actually change habits and form, you know, uh, behaviors in, in a positive way? And, and we put, we've, we've trained over 4,000 federal, state, county, city, tribal officers in Utah through some of the most rigorous situations. We even strap, this is how immersive it is, uh, sensors to them. And if they make a mistake, they get tased and taken down. So it, it really you know, intensifies the real, they, they just get in there and we can measure their heart rates just racing and going up and down. And so all of this data really helps us train, uh, perfect their technique, all in the hopes that they will be safer, that the, the, the communities that they police will be safer. And so it's been a terrific tool, also an educational tool, because people who are skeptical about law enforcement, when we thrust them into these scenarios and allow them, so sometimes it's a high school principal or teacher, and we have a school shooting scenario, or we have multiple ones, and they, it helps to prepare them and understand what we go through in law enforcement. Um, so it, I think it's been wonderful. It's called Vertra. Vertra is the company out of a terrific partner, uh, out of Arizona, and they customize these scenarios in law enforcement agencies. Um, even businesses can purchase them to do training on suicide awareness. I've created a module for autism so that law enforcement doesn't mistake um, behaviors uh, as being defiant when they're really just a child on the spectrum acting very normally. So it's, it's I think, been a terrific tool for us. And it's not headset VR um, but we are working on those types of, of capabilities while we have this incredible Bertra system set up. And and uh, do you, um, Sean, uh, do you have enough uh, sort of experience at this point to tell that if an officer spends, you know, five hours or whatever the required time in this, that it makes a difference in their behavior? Y yes and no. Um, uh, we don't have the type of robust data that some of the scientists on the panel would probably consider to be real data. But anecdotally, through cases, through um, going back and, and, and sharing the, the we, look, we have a curriculum layered on top of, they, they only spend uh, some of their time actually in the module with the VR scenarios. A lot of it is talking through 
uh, reading, uh, watching videos, interacting, role playing. And so, yes, we have seen market improvements in our officers' uh, incidents of violence. Uh, so I, I can't I can't peg it to a specific am- amount of time in the simulator, but we have seen the results. And we, we have derived from that that it's working well for our state and many other states have tried to emulate this now. Throwing off of the... Oh, oh sorry, John, we lost you or I yeah, lost you. Uh, let me ask this next question. I may try to switch networks to see if I think that my problem is my network. But anyone on the panel, you know, aircraft simulators have been around for a long time and they're incredibly sophisticated. And I was just wondering if among the panel of... If there are other examples, training examples that come to mind that uh, that have the kind of power that that Sean's talking about for the law enforcement community, well, I think some of the things that that Sean is talking about are the things that are, that VR is is well suited for, whether it's in headset or in these large simulators. Um, and I think that, is especially relative to the police force and and you know, just all of the the challenges that they face, that that building this sort of empathy layer, VR has been called the empathy machine. And so, uh, you know, I I was very, very excited to hear Sean talk about that they're they're building in also profiles of people who may have unexpected behaviors, not because they're violent criminals, but for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is really the, the sort of the tip of the spear in terms of, of building that level of empathy, building that level of understanding. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be limited to the police force. It's really, you know, in any vertical where that has real value. And then on the behavioral health side, you know, we're seeing really, really good data around being able to change behaviors. So things like addiction and you know, putting people in environments that would normally be triggers for them uh, and then helping them kind of learn what the markers are in their own behaviors so that they can, you know, alter their, their decision-making process and start making better decisions about their, their lives and phobias. And, you know, so they all sort of link together. Okay. Sam, do you have enough experience with the medical world? To, is there an example there? Oh, I mean, endless examples. I mean, in med- medicine is one of the most, in, you know, one of the most interesting disciplines here where this is being applied. And obviously that's simply because the, you know, the, the technologies that we've been training on for decades, you know, cadavers, mannequins, simply can't capture the rare, difficult, unforeseen scenarios that you only encounter after you've, you know, done that procedure on, let's say, 100 or, or, or 500 patients. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why anytime a surgeon, you know, starts, you know, does a new procedure, or tries a new technique, the outcomes aren't nearly as good for the first hundred patients as they are going to be um, for the subsequent hundreds. And this is an opportunity, this is where technology can really come to bear, right? Because we can, um, we can prepare you, we can recreate all those, you know, extremely difficult, rare scenarios, and then let you play through them, whether it's, you know, on a headset or even just more approachable on a phone, um, and, you know, develop a mental model for what's going on and prepare yourself for that scenario. Okay, good. Um, Yana, I I wonder if you have thoughts on training, but I also just wanted to ask you um, to tell the audience where the term, the the name Divine Robot came from. Uh, It's quite intriguing. (laughs) Yeah, turns out a lot of people think we work with robotics, but no, it's more of a wink to the singularity, uh, as it were, so. (laughs) Uh, but in terms of training applications, I think um, we've been in discussions with uh, some companies in the marine industries uh, for evacuation training in VR. And uh, I mean, these kinds of circumstances where it can actually be dangerous to train properly uh, would suit themselves very well to, uh, to virtual reality training. And um, what we did for, for one of our clients who uh, is a manufacturer of red dot scopes for rifles, we did a, a VR hunting simulator. It, it actually it started out as a communication and mar- marketing product to, to have something to show on a trade show. 
but it became so popular that everybody wanted to use it for for training to actually perfecting their their skills uh, using the rifles and um, because we were able to simulate the ballistics in a very real way and also create our own uh, rifle control replica so that you use it's, it's more of a mixed reality application in that sense that you're you're holding what feels and looks like a real gun and when you pull the trigger that's what you do in the virtual world as well so you're able to um, to to improve your hunting skills um, and uh, uh, also, of course, uh, that amounts to fewer animals being injured unnecessarily because they, they know what they're, what they're supposed to do. And another advantage here is this all scales, right? That's the beauty of the technology. We've brought about, at Level X, we've brought about 700,000 medical professionals uh, play our games on mobile. So they're, they're using it for, for mobile training. We've probably brought about 70,000 through AR mixed reality experiences using mobile devices. And then probably about another 7,000 using headsets. So sort of as you move, you know, as we move towards, you know, more broadly available technologies from headsets to phones, you can achieve, you know, orders of magnitude more reach. Is, is there a consensus in this group about headsets one, or the, one way or the other? I mean, I have to say about, it must have been a half a decade ago, I visited Magic Leap, um, which was an early, very well-funded, large player in the space. And, you know, I really bought into the notion of this possibility of resolution at or beyond the level of, of hu the human eye, which is sort of what they were promising. And, you know, I've, I've played with uh, Oculus and I've, I've played with Holo HoloLens and it, it, it all seems like we're, we're waiting on a, a headset technology that's not there. And I just wonder if, if, if the consensus is it's coming and it's just waiting on, you know, the typical kind of evolution of technology, or will it will it be kind of the handset in the future? Well, it, they're okay. coming. They're definitely coming. I mean, uh, Facebook is, is has a deal with Luxottica, who own uh, Ray-Ban. So, you know, we've been talking about these magic wayfarers, <laughs> magic leap as well, yeah. uh, for a long time. So they may very well look like wayfarers. I mean, you look at HoloLens, too, and you saw Magic Leap. Um, those are, uh, Magic Leap came out initially as, as uh, a consumer device, and they've you know, recently switched entirely to enterprise. HoloLens 2 is, is certainly enterprise. Those are heavy devices. Um, uh, you know, Magic Leap moved the compute off, off the device to sort of a, you know, a puck, a power puck, uh, and, and HoloLens has it embedded. But where we really need to get to are true wearables. And even though the wearables that are coming from both Apple and Facebook and potentially Google, they, they uh, acquired a company called Focals by North, uh, they, it will be a driver in the enterprise because they'll start to become part of our day to day. We've had more calls this year on, you know, from CEOs saying, you know, my kid got an Oculus Quest for Christmas. And, you know, I, I looked at it and it actually looks pretty good. Like, what should we be doing here? And so it's sort of getting, uh, you know, moving off of mobile devices, you know, and, and Sam's correct in that, you know, he, he sort of painted that picture. It's, you know, mobile to AR to, to VR headsets, that number decreases dramatically. As these wearables start to hit the market, and they are truly wearable, uh, and they have real functionality in our day to day, that is going to be a big driver in the enterprise. And you're going to see a lot more devices, uh, kind of coming out in 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 your workflow uh, than, than you see today. Yeah. Um, there is a question from one in the audience about industries that have been adopting VR beyond training simulations, and of course. Um, uh, uh, Sam spoke to that, but are there are there other sort of industrial scale points to to to, to explore? Let me um, just uh, also mention uh, something that I think Amy brought up earlier uh, that I think is a very important use case for for VR, uh, and, and and that was she was talking about uh, addiction and addiction recovery and how to how we deal with that. You, the, America in particular has a real problem with its pain management, and we all obviously have an opioid epidemic we're still contending with. It's interesting. I have an A&E show that I co-produce um, called Addiction Unplugged, and one of the, not to total spoil it for my partner, Stu Goffman, I, we're working on one episode for our next season that deploys VR technology to help people manage pain 
and create more of a mindfulness approach to addressing pain than a chemical approach to addressing pain. That's It's scalable. It's very uh, adoptable. And that's something outside of just training. Um, again, immersive and, and trying to help people tap into um, the power of their own body and their own mind. It's a, it's a really intriguing, um, I think, a, a application. That's quite straight. A job, you know, taking down criminals and human traffickers and drug traffickers and murderers. So we, we, we do our job there. But yeah, I'm a bit of a unicorn. Uh, most of them have called me. I don't have, I didn't come from the prosecutorial world. I was running, buying and selling businesses. And um, I think that's probably a good thing, though, on the regulatory side. Uh, when we have regulators who sort of uh, sometimes inadvertently get in the way of innovation, lawmakers who make the laws and then regulators who apply sort of ill fit laws laws that are anachronisms to try to stay ahead of the game. It's really cumbersome. And so I think I offer a little bit of insight to my colleagues uh, globally to help find that equilibrium between regulation and innovation. Okay. This is a question for the panel generally. Maybe we sort of move to the political and get at the question of how this technology is going to affect society. You know, I, I grew up on a generation of, of science fiction written by William Gibson and Neil Stevenson, and most importantly, I think, by Werner Vinge. There's a, a novel he wrote called, uh, I think it was called Gravity, uh, no, Rainbow's End, about uh, augmented reality, which really dealt with the sociological implications of this technology. And, uh, you know, all of those novels tended to move in a dystopian direction. And I, I saw that right before we, uh, a couple of weeks before this panel, a Wired ran a, uh, sort of a critique of this technology that was dystopian. I, I wanted to specifically ask if you can see this technology in the future having a role in franchising uh, or, or improving the function of democracy. Anybody have any political uses of this technology? Is it? I think it comes back to education. It's, it's you know, we we can leverage this technology. I'm actually glad you brought up science fiction and this dystopian vision. It's actually not a coincidence that augmented reality or mixed reality looks like minority report. What happens is these become part of entertainment. They become sort of part of the common vernacular. And then we sort of are inextricably on that particular vision of the future and we've lost touch with our ability to be proactive in terms of how we leverage this technology. We're very much, you know, kind of in reactive mode, like we've been in the pandemic. But if we leverage this technology, you know, sort of goes back to the question of what are some of the other use cases, we can change the way we educate. There, right now, the education system is is a very sort of linear path, right? And we we start out be, being these these truly creative beings, being able to you know pull together all manners of, of sort of disparate thought, which don't live in reality. So we just sort of crush that disparate, you know, kind of dot connecting into a much more linear thought process. But the real entrepreneurs, and I, I bet if we map Sean's brain, we'd, we'd find this as well. They connect dots that and and find commonality and solutions using sort of a volumetric thinking style as opposed to this linear thought process. But linear thought is what we're teaching people, right? And so those who rise above and become entrepreneurs have done it in spite of the education system. But we now have a three-dimensional system where that we can use for teaching and, you know, breeding curiosity. And instead of sort of crushing that ability to create something from nothing and create these ideas from multiple different sources to actually nurture that yeah, as well I think as John, nurturing yeah. different personalities. Sorry, go ahead, John. No, I wholeheartedly agree. I just want to say to Amy's point, if you take just civics alone, which most students really don't, and I'm not talking about big P politics, partisanship. It's about learning what the founding documents are around, touching, feeling them, being around them. I mean, museum applications, that's kind of lower level, but really important educational applications, powerful. If you're talking about voting, I think 
you can't talk about VR just in a and AI okay. VR with you know it's, it's all of these things together can be very powerful tools, but harnessed the right way, like any technology, it, it can it, it can be abused, and so I, I think there are many positive aspects, and we ought to be optimistic about it and and not uh, you know fatalistic, uh, but we should have a healthy. This is my my parting comments because I know our time's uh, coming to an end. A, a healthy respect for. Um, you know, the, the potential abuse of technology also. Yeah, I think that the technology, I mean, one example that, you know, we take the games industry historically, we've taken a lot of advantage of is cognitive bias, right? And we use that to create experiences that are more engaging and potentially have, you know, the potential to create learning. I think these technologies and these design methodologies have the ability to help people overcome cognitive bias. And if we can do that, I think that's a real boom for democracy. Uh, John, do you, do you want to understand? Sorry. Just yeah. want to mention in terms of uh, being impatient with uh, VR, we really have to consider like how long we've been at it. Uh, consider that when the first uh, telephone uh, was invented, and I mean, how long do we have to wait for the iPhone? So we can't really expect uh, the headsets to become, you know, si similar to the iPhone uh, and that quickly. Um, yeah. yeah. I I absolutely agree. I had this moment once in downtown San Francisco where I was walking down the street and I noticed that half the people were looking down at their phones. And I said to myself, this can't be the end of user interface. There has to be something that comes after this. And it will probably uh, be VR. I also wanted to give just a short plug. Uh, I watched a little bit from the distance. The Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley is trying to reinvent itself with a virtual museum and um, it, it's actually quite inspiring. I, I, it, it hasn't come as quickly as I would have liked to have seen, but I, to your point, Jana, these things take time. It was, the, it was the year of the computer network, I think for 20 years before it was the year of the computer network. And now uh, computer networks are com threaded completely through our, our environment. Um, does anybody else want to offer a closing thought? If not, I want to thank you guys for being uh, Thanks, patient with me and, and hanging in there. And uh, that's great. So hope to see everyone again. All right. Okay. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Cheers.